This presentation will take a look at Jeremiah chapters 1 through 3, 7, 16 through 18, and 20. The great prophet Jeremiah, who is a contemporary with Lehi of the Book of Mormon. As always, I encourage you to read the chapters before listening. They'll be aware of the details of what I'm talking about. By way of introduction, it was Jeremiah's privilege, or burden some would say, to predict and then live through the fall of Judah to Babylon. One of the first things the Lord told Jeremiah was, I will hasten my word to perform it. It's in chapter 1 verse 12. Jeremiah, like Mormon, was called to labor among a people for whom there was no hope because they refused to repent, and the day of grace was passed with them, both temporally and spiritually. Mormon, after witnessing the destruction of the Nephite nation, cried out for his people. Here was a righteous man, one of the best, lamenting over his people who were so blind, so foolish, so spiritually dead. Jeremiah too mourned his people's wickedness. You may think of Jeremiah as a harsh man as you read his scorching denunciations of the Jewish people and the lives they were living, but he was not. His motivation, like Moroni's, was love. A prophet does not select where and when he serves. God chooses when and to whom a prophet is sent. One may be an Enoch and build Zion, or a David O. McKay and preside over the church in a time of peace and prosperity. Another may be a Mormon or a Jeremiah and try in vain to save a rebellious and backsliding people. Each has his calling, each has his time, each has his lesson for you to learn. Look for Jeremiah's lesson as you study this great prophet. Uh, Lehi got to get out of the destruction of Babylon and living through all of that destruction. Though he had his own challenges of eight years in the wilderness, crossing the ocean, and then the destructive nature of his two sons and the nation they created called the Lamanites. Let's take a look at Jeremiah chapter 1, 1 through 3, and this good idea of the setting of Jeremiah. Jeremiah, a Levite, came from Anathot, a town of the priests that lay a few miles northeast of Jerusalem in the tribal territory of Benjamin. He labored in his prophetic colony during the reign of at least four kings of Judah, Josiah, Jeho Jehoahaz, Jehoiakim, and Zedekiah. He began his labors as a youth in approximately 627 B.C. and was the leading prophet in Jerusalem, ser serving with Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Lehi, and others. You can see 1 Nephi 1, 4. Since Lehi and Nephi refer to Jeremiah's prophecies, it is safe to assume that some of them were recorded on the brass plates. With the exception of Josiah, all the kings of Judah during Jeremiah's ministry were unworthy men under whom the country suffered severely. Even during the reign of the earlier kings, the wicked Manasseh, the Baal cult was restored among the Jews, and there was introduced the worship of the heavenly planets in accordance with the dictates of the Assyrio-Babylonian re religion. Jeremiah, therefore, found idolatry, hill worship, and heathen religious practices rampant among his people. Heathen idols stood in the temples. Children were sacrificed to Baal Moloch, and Baal was especially evoked as the usual heathen deity. The worship of the Queen of Heaven ought also to be mentioned. The corruption of the nationals' religious worship was, of course, accompanied by all manner of immorality and unrighteousness, against which the prophet had continually to testify. Uh, Baal worship was especially immoral, as you practice sexual intercourse as a part of worship service with religious prostitutes. That ought to give you some idea. The poor were forgotten. Jeremiah was surrounded on all sides by almost total apostasy. But professional prophets were there were a plenty. Here says Dr. H. L. Willett. He was, he being Jeremiah, was surrounded by plenty of prophets, but they were the smooth, easygoing prophets. I'm sorry, popular professional preachers whose words awaken no conscience and who assured the people that the nation was safe in the protecting care of God. This was a true message in 
Isaiah's day, but that time was long since past, and Jerusalem was destined for captivity. Thus, Jeremiah was doomed to preach an unwelcome message, while the false prophets persuaded the people that he was unpatriotic, uninspired, and pessimistic. Isn't that interesting? The true prophets, how they get characterized. Maybe that should be a key to us when our prophets start getting characterized as unpatriotic, uninspired, and pessimistic, then that means they're right on the money. When society claims them of that, which they do today. Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 4 through 5, the call of Jeremiah. Jeremiah 1, 4 through 5 is a powerful proof of our premortal existence as individuals. The Lord certified to Jeremiah that his calling to a mission as a prophet unto the nations antedated his birth. The phrase, I knew thee, Jeremiah 1, 5, means more than a casual acquaintance. The Hebrew word yada, which is translated new, connotes a very personal, intimate relationship. Indeed, Jeremiah's premortal appointment consisted of being foreordained, sanctified, and sent forth. Because of Latter-day Revelation in Scripture, we have greater proof of this intimate setting and relationship with Jehovah and our Heavenly Father from Abraham 3, 22-23. Now, the Lord has shown unto me, Abraham, the intelligences that were organized before the world was. And among all there, these were the many great noble and great ones. And God saw that these souls that they were good, and he stood in the midst of them. And he said, These I will make my rulers. For he stood among those that were spirits, and he saw that they were good. And he said unto me, Abraham, thou art one of them. Thou wast chosen before thou wast born. Jehovah and Heavenly Father were very, very well acquainted with us before coming here. Or else how could he separate us? Jeremiah chapter 1 verses 6 through 10, the charge that Jeremiah is giving. Jeremiah, like others, called by the Lord to such heavy and humbling assignments, expresses feelings of inadequacy. Compare Jeremiah's feelings with those such as Enoch, as in Moses 6.31, Moses, Exodus 4.10, and Gideon, Judges 6.15. All of them felt inadequate to the calling. I would say Anyone who is humble and is called to that feels that. Anyone who feels up to the calling probably shouldn't have the calling. In Jeremiah 19, or I'm sorry, Jeremiah 1, 9, the role of a prophet is succinctly set forth. A prophet does not necessarily say what he wants to say, for the Lord puts his own words in the mouth of the prophet. That is why it does not matter whether the word comes from God or through his servant. It is the same, as Doctrine and Covenants 138 clearly points out. So Jeremiah will only say those things which he is charged of saying. If he comes across pessimistic and harsh, it's because that's what Judah has chosen for Jehovah to say to them because of the way they have acted and their unrighteous use of agency. Jeremiah, oh, Jeremiah 1, 11 through 16, what seest thou? Jeremiah's first vision was of a branch of an almond tree. An almond branch was evidently chosen because it is the first tree to bud in spring. As the almond tree hastens to come into blossom, so would the word of the Lord through Jerusalem hasten to fulfillment. And so what I'm about to tell you, Judah, is going to hasten and come to pass, just like the blossoming of the almond tree. Next, the vision of a seething pot, or a pot that's boiling, was shown to Jeremiah, symbolizing the disaster and pain which, like the contents of a boiling cauldron, would spill over and run down the kingdoms of the north to overwhelm Judah. The burning of incense in Jeremiah 1.16 is a symbol of prayer. See Revelation 5.8 and 8.3. For more is implied in the Lord's accusation than just a ritual of burning incense to false gods. The people were seeking help and guidance through prayer from the false gods rather than from the Lord. So when just as they burnt incense to these false gods, it's not like they were just lighting something. They were pondering and praying and pleading to false gods and false idols, thinking that they could hear them and help them. That's just ridiculous. 
gospel principle. But there is a law given, and a punishment affixed, and a repentance granted, which repentance claimeth mercy, otherwise justice claimeth the creature, and executeth the law, and the law inflicteth the punishment. If not so, the works of justice would be destroyed, and God would cease to be God. In other words, Judah, you must be destroyed. That is the law of justice that you have now chosen. You cannot receive mercy without repentance. Judah is going to find that out, the house of Israel. You want repentance and you want mercy, then you better repent. If you want it granted mercy, Judah would not do that. Therefore, the law must be executed. Destruction was imminent. And so it is personally in our lives if we foolishly think God will just, because he loves me so much, he won't do anything. What a ridiculous, deceiving phrase Satan has got so many members of the church with. Jeremiah 2, 1 through 19, the waters of life forsaken. The sequence of Israel's spiritual development is outlined in Jeremiah chapter 2. So here is how Jeremiah outlines their spiritual or lack of spiritual development. One, Israel's early devotion and righteousness, or in verses 2 through 3. Two, Israel's apostasy, verses 4 through 14. The Lord asked what fault the people found in him that justified their turning away from him. Of course, there is no answer. Number three, tragic results of apostasy. That's verses 14 through 19. The Lord's people had forsaken him, gone from far from him, verse 5, and changed their glory for that which doth not profit, verse 11. Even the heathen nations did not forsake their gods for others, verses 10 through 11. He's saying, heathen nations don't at least stick with the God that they worship. You change willy-nilly from Jehovah to this God to Baal to Moloch to whatever. And so their tragic downfall. Number four, in verse 13, the two evils committed by Judah are told in figurative terms. They have forsaken the fountain, Jehovah, of living water, life. And they have hewn out broken cisterns, gods, meaning, which can hold no water, which is life. Then the image is changed, and the Lord states that Israel had partaken of the waters of Sheor, the Nile, or of the river, the Euphrates. In other words, they drank the spiritual waters of Egypt and Babylon and were filled with lifeless waters of idolatry. So instead of partaking of the water that would give them life, Jehovah, they partook of the false waters of the false gods of Egypt and the Euphrates of Babylon. And so Israel does today, some. Number five, verse 19, the important truth that one is punished by as well as for one's transgressions. The phrase, my fear is not in them, verse 19, refers to the fear of God. Fear in the Hebrew denotes a sense of reverent awe and profound respect. If the Jews had this fear in them, they would not need to learn through the consequences of their transgressions. And so we see the tragic downfall of the house of Judah, or the kingdom of Judah, I should say. Jeremiah chapter 2, verses 20 to chapters 3, verse 5, Judah is now denounced. Jeremiah will prophesy of their denouncement. Jeremiah uses very vivid imagery in denouncing Judah. Broken thy yoke and burst thy bands, verse 20. The Lord had delivered them from the bondage of Egypt. I, I, I broke your bands and, and your yoke from Egypt, and, and, and I saved you from them. That's verse 20. But now they are playing the harlot, verse 20. Judah had committed idolatry or spiritual adultery with false gods, as well as actually engaging in unchaste practices. 
The degenerate plant of a strange vine, verse 21, means this wild vine brought forth poisonous berries or evil works. Judah has become like a degenerate vine. It's not good for anything. Wash thee with nitri, lie, and take thee much soap, yet thine iniquity is marked. Verse 22. The most powerful means of purification could not cleanse Judah's sins. The, the soap that they have is used in this. Even this will not clean you up because they are so marked with iniquity and will not repent. In the valley, verse 23, probably referring to, it was the valley was the Hinnom Valley where children were sacrificed. See Jeremiah 7.31. A swift dromedary traversing her ways, a wild ass that sniffed up the wind at her pleasure, verses 20 through 24. The imagery indicates that as a camel or a wild ass in heat runs back and forth during the mating season, so did Israel run after false gods. Israel and the kingdom of Judah are like animals in heat and are just lusting after these false gods. Withhold thy foot from being sawed and thy throat from first, thirst, verse 25, meaning in their anxiety to follow after the peoples of the world and worship false gods, they ran out of the house barefoot and would not even stop to slack their thirst. Ah, oh, they're in such a hurry to be like the world. They just can't stand being different. Gotta have my Coca-Cola. Saying to a stock, thou art my father, and to a stone thou hast brought me forth, verse 27, is referring to Israel's worshipped images of wood and stone as the gods, to whom they owed life and being. Where are thy gods, verse 28, the Lord's challenged Judah to find help from the false idols, now that destruction threatened her. Yeah, we're, let's see if your false gods will help you. Let's see how that turns out, Israel. In vain have I smitten you, verse 30. Even the judgments of the past, such as the fall of the northern kingdom. Judah, the king of Judah, saw what it, Assyria did to the northern kingdom and wiped them out because of their wickedness. And the siege of Judah by Assyria were not enough to even bring the people to repentance. Even that, that's how hard-hearted they were. Your own sword hath devoured your prophets, verse 30. The people killed the prophets sent by God to warn them. If you remember, go look in the first chapter of 1 Nephi, when Lehi goes out and prophesies that a Savior is to come, and that Babylon will come and destroy Judah. I think it's either verse 19 or 20. The Jews immediately took to try to stone and kill him. That's why he has to leave. Jeremiah doesn't get to leave. He has to live through it all. Can a maid forget her ornaments? Verse 32. See also verse 33 and 34. Unlike, unlike the bride who adorns herself with chastity and faithfulness to her husband, this bride of Judah was found with soiled skirts, which were so obvious that a search was not required to find them. Israel had become so skilled in doing evil that she could teach even the experienced harlots of idolatry. Isn't that something? Is Judah, the members of the church, have fallen so bad and were so steeped in adultery and idolatry that they could teach the prostitutes how to sin? That's, that's pretty wicked. Shall not return unto her again. Chapter 3, verse 1. The law in Deuteronomy 24, 1 through 4 did not permit a man to remarry his ex wife whom he divorced for adultery. She later remarries and divorces again, or her later husband dies so as not to keep Israel from thinking they were free to divorce one another at will so that they would sample other mates and then get together again. So Judah had played the harlot committing spiritual adultery with false gods and thought they could just return to Jehovah. 
in the in thy ways thou set for them as the Arabian in the wilderness, chapter three, verse two, just like the Bedouins eagerly awaited for caravans to spoil them in the desert, so Judah eagerly awaits for the immoral practices associated with heathen worship. Therefore Jehovah was withholding rain from them, and because Judah was a whore's forehead meaning that they have a brazen face, shameless of their sins, refusing to be ashamed. And so he compares them to how a prostitute has no shame, or at least at some point those who've done it long enough. That's what the horse, horse forehead is referring to, that Israel and in the kingdom of Judah have now become so shameless and are not ashamed of their sins. That's how brazen they are. We see that in the world today. Those who who delight in immorality, sex before marriage, abortion. Uh, you know, they're proud that they had an abortion, all that stuff. It's just very brazen. All the while, Judah had the false notion that surely Jehovah would not be angry forever, as Judah was her way with false gods, as Judah has her way with false gods. Chapter 3, verses 4 through 5. Again, not knowing the doctrine, and Jehovah is a dangerous thing. Yeah, Jehovah was just going to slap him on the wrist and say, oh, you didn't mean it. There are too many in this church who think, oh, because love, God loves me so much, he'll let me into the celestial kingdom. Exaltation has nothing to do with his love. It's whether you love him to keep the commandments. Have you thought about that? It's all about our love for him. If you love me, Christ said, keep my commandments. You can say it with your lips all you want. We don't keep the commandments. We really don't love him. I mean, don't be that foolish. Gospel principle, when we sin, we divorce ourselves from God. That's what Jeremiah is warning Judah. God's going to divorce you. And rightly so. Jeremiah chapter 3, 6 through 11. Played the harlot. Jeremiah continued the marriage symbolism as he began in chapter 2, verse 32. Jeremiah 3, 6, 9, 14, and 20 show that the children of Israel had broken their vows to the Lord and played the harlot with other gods. First, northern Israel, the ten tribes, Judah's sister, had also committed idol adultery, idolatry with false gods. And the Lord had given her a bill of divorcement and put her away meaning she was taken captive by the Assyrians, which Judah had witnessed. Yet Judah, seeing the destruction, destructive nature of the northern kingdom, went th through for worshiping false gods, went and did the same and would not repent, but pretended feignedly to. So they kind of pretend that they're sorry. God knows the difference. We can be such idiots down here sometimes, can't we? Thus, the northern kingdom of Israel will be more justified because Judah had even more of a warning of such wickedness could do than Israel had. They had watched what Israel went through. Judah will be punished more because they should have known better. Gospel principle, cheating on God by following the gods of the world, idolatry, is the same as adultery. Jeremiah 3, 12 through 19, a Latter-day prophecy and promise. In the midst of condemning Judah for their apostasy, Jeremiah turned to the future when Israel would be again become a faithful wife and be reclaimed. The Lord reminded Israel that he is merciful if they would turn back to him. See verses 12 through 13. The Lord promises missionary work and gathering of Zion. Verse 14. Knowledge and understanding taught by faithful pastors, meaning church leaders, verse 15. The fulfillment of the old covenant and the establishment of a new covenant, verse 16. The restoration of Jerusalem to righteousness, verse 17. The gathering of Israel, including the return of the lost tribes from the north, and the reuniting of the children of Judah in the lands of their inheritance, see verses 18 through 19. So you can see, latter day, that we're still working on this. And some of this still has not happened. Jerusalem has not been restored to righteousness yet. And the ten tribes have not returned. 
Gospel principle, the mercy of God provided through the atonement of Jesus Christ to be able to forgive sin is only available upon the conditions of repentance. Let's go to chapter 7, verses 1 through 4. The temple would not save Judah. That's interesting, isn't it? They thought outward things like programs and temples and buildings and stuff would save them instead of the God who they were to point to. Uh, there's a lesson for us in that today. There's not one program. No, no matter amount of temple attendance, no matter amount of missionary work is going to save us, brothers and sisters. Jesus Christ saves us. The boldness of Jeremiah's statement can be realized only when one recalls, recalls the importance to the temple by the reforms of Joshua in 621 BC. Joshua had made it the sole place of sacrificial worship of Jehovah for all Jews in an attempt to stamp out idol worship. The temple and its priests thus had acquired by this time greater importance than ever before. Then in the name of Jehovah, Jeremiah issues a challenge that struck at the very existence of the temple. He plainly told the Jews that if they would mend their ways and become righteous, they would be spared. Otherwise, not even the temple would save them because they had made the temple a den of robbers. Verse 11. Because of the great reverence the people had for the temple, though it was a false reverence, it is not surprising that Jeremiah was quickly arrested and imprisoned. So he declares to them that even the temple we destroyed, they are so mad that they arrest and imprison the prophet of God. This is the members of the church. I'm sure there are some today that would like to arrest the first presidency, do not like the things they preach. In fact, I've heard of such. The language of Jeremiah 7.11, combined with that of Isaiah 56.7, was used by Jesus when he cleansed the temple. Remember, you have made it a, a den of thieves, of robbers and thieves. And so the Messiah, Jesus, refers to this also, what Israel in his day had turned the temple into. Jeremiah 7, 5 through 7, cause and effect. Many of God's prophets use the if-then cause and effect relationship to teach gospel principles to the people. Jeremiah is no exception. Gospel principle, if this in verses 5 through 7, if we completely mend our ways, execute justice, oppress not the stranger, the fatherless, or widow, nor shed innocent blood, and not serve the gods, then God will cause us to dwell in the land he gave to our fathers. That's a great cause and effect relationship. We want to be faithfully in this land, on this earth, in exaltation, in the subsequent for eternity then we better complete the if portion of that. Jeremiah 7, verses 8 through 34, Jehovah's rejection of Judah. Verse 8, the people were flattered away by the lying words of the false prophets in Judah who pronounced all is well in Zion. They would say, peace, peace, when there is no peace. Verse 9 through 10, Though the people were committing, that should be though, sorry. Though the people were committing adultery and idolatry, they mistakenly thought that ritual, ritually participating in the formality of worship at the temple would deliver them from their abominations. Even today, temple worship is just a program that points to one that points one to the Savior and His grace. The program, in and of itself, never has power to save anyone. Only in and through the name of Christ is salvation and exaltation offered. We must come unto him. Our temple worship has to point us to him. That's where the salvation is. Not just going and doing the work. If that's all you have, you'll miss exaltation and salvation. Verse 11, the children of Israel and Judah had turned the temple and its rituals into a den of robbers. A place of retreat, a, a, a den of robbers, is a place of retreat in intervals between acts of violence. Thinking God would see their deceitful acts of temple worship and justify them, while God always sees through any and all artificial religious behaviors. They actually deceive themselves thinking, oh, God will see our outward religious stuff and how fervent we are in this temple worship, and that will fool him. 
Yeah, yeah, try that. Yeah, that'll, yeah. Go do temple work, do your purple work, and then go home and yell and abuse your wife, your spouse, your kids, whatever, verbally, physically, emotionally abuse them. Yeah, and see if that temple worship does you any good. Alma, chapter 5, verses 16 through 17, brought this very thing up when he said, I say unto you, can you imagine to yourselves that you hear the voice of the Lord saying to you in that day, come unto me? Ye blessed, for behold, your works have been the works of righteousness upon the face of the earth. Or do you imagine to yourselves that you can lie unto the Lord in that day and say, Lord, our works have been works of righteousness upon the face of the earth, and that he will save you? See, that's exactly what Jeremiah is telling you. You think you're going to be able to lie and say that. Oh, look at all the great things we have in the temple. Yeah, yeah, that's going to save you. Israel must have thought that they could lie unto the Lord and fool him with counterfeit works of righteousness. And so do some today. Why do you think President Nelson stood up and chastised the church for abuse? Knock it off, he said. Of spouse and of children, knock it off. Verses 4, 12 through 14. After the Israelites under Joshua conquered the land of Canaan, the tabernacle was equivalent of the temple was set up at Shiloh. Eventually, Israel became so wicked that they set up graven images and worshipped them in direct competition with the tabernacle. A short time later, the Philistines attacked the Israelites and defeated them. They overran Shiloh and took the Ark of the Covenant in the battle. The parallel between Israel and Judah should have been evident. For the wicked to look to the temple as a source of protection was foolish. They tried that once before. I took Shiloh. I, I destroyed Shiloh. I took the Ark of the Covenant. The enemy captured it. What makes you think I will not destroy the temple again? If you do not repent. Just because we have a lot of temples in this valley of Salt Lake in Utah County doesn't mean we're exempt from destruction because of our wicked behavior. Verses 15 through 16, since Judah would be taken captive by the Babylonians as a result of their unwise use of agency, Jeremiah was not to pray for their deliverance. Then time to repent to avoid, then time to repent to avoid destruction was passed. They now had to eat the fruit of their labors. Well, not good when the prophets said, uh, don't even pray for them anymore. Verses 18 through 20. Israel was sinning out in the open without any shame or disgrace to the confusion of their own faces. The queen of heaven is identified either with the moon or with the Assyrian goddess Ishtar, the planet Venus. The Jewish women were especially given to that worship, offering incense and cakes stamped with a representation of the goddess. Therefore, God's justice would be executed because that's what the people had chosen. Verses 20 through 20. 21 through 23, Jehovah reminded the people that obedience is more critical to God than the outward rituals of sacrifice performed in the temple. The law of obedience was the earliest law of all. The most important, that of sacrifice, was only secondary importance. Secondary importance. Again, why does he stand up in conference and tell us to knock off the abuse in our families? Because no matter how much temple you work you do, if you don't knock that off, you're still going to go to hell. I, uh, verses 24 through 26. Since Israel came out of Egypt, they had struggled with following in the way of Jehovah instead of walking in their own way and after the image of their own God. This the Savior told Joseph Smith would be the calamity that would plague Israel and the world in the last days. We do the same thing. Instead of following and walking in God's way, we want to walk after our own way. That's the calamity Joseph Smith said would be the destruction. And so it is. Again, why do you think President Nelson stands up and says, knock off the abuse. Follow in God's way. Verses 27 to 28. Though Jeremiah still sought to ex exhort the people to repentance, Jehovah told him not to expect them to heed him. And in verse 29. For their sins, the people must take up a lament. The cutting off of the hair was a symbol of grief. The Hebrew text reads literally, cut off your crown, the nezer. The hair was looked on as, in a sense, a diadem. 
To cut off the hair was to bring down Israel's pride. But there may be here an overtone of something else. The long hair of the Nazarite was a sign of his consecration to Jehovah. The removal of the hair signified an, ab an abandonment of his consecration. In Jeremiah's view, Israel, now represented only by Judah and Jerusalem, had abandoned her consecration to Yahweh, or Jehovah, and was not worthy to wear the crown of her long hair. So that's what that is referring to. Verses 30 through 31. Not only were the people desecrating the temple with false religious worship, but they had also built up a high place of worship to the god Moloch, where they offered child sacrifices, Tophet being near the eastern extremity of the southern reach in the valley of Hinnom. So here is, you can see this chart, this picture, and you see the temple mount where the temple would have been. And then you see down here on the right, the Valley of Hinnom. You see the lower city. Well, where I have the circle is where this Tophet was placed and where they put a, an altar to Moloch and worshiped. Look, it's just how many feet from the Temple Mount? They are, had an altar for human sacrifice of children. Do you see why Jehovah is just a little concerned and a little ticked off with Judah? Yeah, how far away is Planned Parenthood from Temple Square? I think it's on 9th East. Nine blocks? Yeah, that's good. Verses 32 through 34. Thus will Jehovah turn Tophet and the Valley of Hinnom into the Valley of Slaughter as the Babylonians conquer Jerusalem and leave the bodies of the dead as food for the fowls of the air and beasts of the earth, bringing sorrow, misery, and desolation. Gospel principle of God's mercy is conditional only upon repentance. Judah wouldn't repent, therefore they do not deserve God's mercy. Jeremiah 16, 1-12, Thou shalt not. Jeremiah's day was a sad one for Judah. To symbolize that truth, the Lord told his prophet three things he was not to do. Jeremiah was one, he was not to marry or father children. So universal was the calamity bearing down upon the people that God did not want children to suffer its outrage. This commandment, like the one to Hosea to take a wife of whoredoms, may not have been a literal one. Perhaps the meaning is that Jeremiah was not to expect that his people would marry themselves to the coven again, nor was he expected to get spiritual children converts from his ministry. Uh, either way, it's a sad condition. Number two, he was not to lament those in Judah who died by the sword or famine, since they brought these judgments upon themselves. And number three, he was not to feast or eat with friends in Jerusalem, verse 8, since feasting was a sign of celebration and eating together a symbol of fellowship. So the very acts that Jeremiah was asked not to do was symbolic of the destruction of Jerusalem. In addition, Jeremiah was commanded to explain clearly to the people the reason for his actions, as well as the reason for their coming punishment. Jeremiah 16, verses 13 through 21, uh, Doom and Delivery. A little grand Richards commented on these verses. This is what he said. Just contemplate that statement, verses 14 through 15, for a few moments. Think how the Jews and the Christians all through these past centuries have praised the Lord for his great hand of deliverance under the hands of Moses when he led Israel out of captivity. And yet here comes Jeremiah with this word of the holy prophet telling us that in the latter days there shall no more remember that, but how God has gathered scattered Israel from the lands whether he has driven them. And Jeremiah saw the day when the Lord would do this very thing, when he would call for many fishers and many hunters, and they shall hunt them from every mountain and from every hill and out of the holes of the rocks. Where do you find those fishers and hunters that we read about in this great prophecy of Jeremiah? They are these 14,000 missionaries of this church and those who have preceded them from the time that the prophet Joseph Smith received the truth and sent the messengers out to share it with the world. Thus they have gone out fishing and hunting, gathering them from the hills and mountains and holes in the rocks. I think that is more literal than some of us think. Also, this 
verses about hunters and fishers of men that in the latter days God would restore Israel and Jerusalem and Judah and would restore back the scattered condition of Israel. Fishers and hunters, well, fishing back then with nets. Some missions would bring in loads of people, right? You see, you see that in South America or at some points and other places where just many flock into the church. And then you get some mission. You go to Europe, Germany. My brother went to Denmark. And you're lucky if you got anybody to come in. It was like hunting. Sometimes you go hunting for deer and you get nothing. There are some who go to hunting missions. And you're not going to get very much. doesn't mean you didn't do the work, right? It's just that you went to a hunting mission. For Jeremiah's custom of throwing in a bright and a bright thought among thorny ones, that this is what he's doing in chapter 16. You can see chapter 3, 14, 4, 27, 5, 10, 18, 27, 22, 33, 32, 37. Jeremiah was known for it because he had to preach gloom and destruction. That was his mission. That's what Jehovah told him to do. But he th throws in bright spots. And those were those are if you want to look those up. The gospel principle. By the use of our agency, we decide how God will treat us. And so, also how God will preach to us. Again, President Nelson gets up and tells us to knock off the abuse in our homes. That's because that's what we're doing in our homes. We decide what's being taught to us from the pulpit. We in modern Israel need to knock it off. Abuse in any form is abhorrent to God. Especially in the house of Israel. Jeremiah 17 verses 1 through 18. We have a lot of metaphors and similes. This chapter is full of metaphors and similes with which the prophet Jeremiah illustrated Judah's fallen state. Their sin is written with a pen of iron and with a point of a diamond. It's written in, in, like in stone. These metaphors speak of how deeply sin was embedded in Israel's consciousness. O oh, mountain in the field. O oh, my mountain in the field is likely a reference to Jerusalem, which is nestled in the hill country of Judah. The focus of one's trust determines whether he is cursed or blessed. See verses 5 through 7. The heat in the desert represents Judah as a withered tree without moisture or sustenance. The Lord searches the heart and tries the reins, meaning the inner self, to determine direction. Verse 10. Like a bird, partridge, that sits on an egg that will not hatch, so those of Judah who get rich by dishonest means will leave empty-handed. Verse 11. Jesus Christ, Jehovah in the Old Testament, is the very hope of Israel, the fountain of living water. Verse 13. Jesus is the good shepherd, a pastor to those who follow him. See verse 16. Jeremiah 17, now verses 19 through 27, in a very, very dramatic way, at least I think for us in Latter-day Israel. Could have been for them, but they're so far gone that I doubt they even caught it. But I think this is meant for us to catch. Jeremiah is going to show us how important what it, and what it means to keep the Sabbath day holy, why this is so significant. First of all, we need to look at verses 2 through 16, the different prophecies concerning the house of Israel and Judah. Here's what Jeremiah just quickly prophesies and what they are like. Chapter 2, 2 5. Israel has become vain, meaning to exhale, <sighs> worthlessness, also used to designate the worship of idols, just that it's worthless. 2, 8 through 13, priests, pastors, prophets, all did that which did not profit. The heathen nations do not change their gods, but God's people change their God, Jehovah, for that what does not profit. Two evils Israel has committed, forsaken Jehovah, the fountains of living water, and made themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. 2.19, Israel lacks reverence, respect, and fear towards Jehovah. 2, 23 through 24, Israel has become like lusty animals who chase those in heat to satisfy their desires. 2, 26 through 28, Israel has turned to gods of stone and wood. Let them save Israel if they can. 2, 32 through 35, Israel's wickedness is so bad that they can teach the prostitutes about wickedness. That one's incredible. Chapter 3, 
3, 1 through 2, Israel has played the harlot with many lying in wait like Ar- Ar- Arabians in desert eagerly awaiting for a caravan. 3, 3, the people have brazen faces because they have no shame, no shame for their sins. 3, 6 through 11, Judah has done worse than the northern kingdom of Israel since they watched the consequences of their wickedness by being taken captive by Assyria. Yet Judah did not learn from this and went and played the harlot also. 3, 20 through 23, Jehovah pleads for their return to him. Chapter 4, 5 through 14, blow the trumpet. Destruction is coming because of the lies of the false prophets, prophets telling the people they will have peace. 4, 8, 18 through 19, Jim, Jeremiah's lament. He laments what's coming. 4, 22, there are silly people. Not good when the prophet calls you silly people or Jehovah, God calls you silly people. Chapter 5, universal corruption, 5-1. Five, 5-7-8, five, lust and covetousness of Israel. 5, 10 through 15, in denial of the destruction to come. Oh, we're fine, we're fine. All's well in Zion, they would say. 5, 21 through 27, wickedness and rebellion was prevalent. Chapter 6, 6, 10, 13, 19, broke the covenant, are covetous, and they will not hearken. 6, 22 through 23, destruction is coming from the north, cruel and mighty. Chapter 7, 3 through 4, thought the temple would save them. And just the formality of worship, not having true hearts. 7, 9 through 15, just doing the gospel is not enough, he tried to warn them. 7, 16, and then 11, 14, Jeremiah was not to pray for the people. They had gone so far. 7, 29 through 31, the loss of consecration would bring grief. Chapter 8, 8, 1 through 2, they worshiped the creation instead of the creator. 8, 8 through 9, they twisted the law of the Lord into justifying their sins. Verses 8, 13 through 17, gall of bitterness is coming, Jeremiah warns them. Chapter 9, 3 through 8, deceitful, they have become a deceitful people. 9, 13 through 16, forsaken Jehovah and walk after themselves, thus they will drink the bitter cup. They walk after themselves, meaning they do their own thing. 9, 19 through 21, there will be weeping and wailing. He prophesies chapter 11, 11 through 13, Israel openly sinned. This was not done in ignorance. They knew what they were doing. They had been taught. 11, 19 through 21, they were seeking the life of Jeremiah. Chapter 13, 10 through 11, Judah will be good for nothing. 19 through 25 in chapter 13, Judah to be carried away, unable to repent, he prophesies. Chapter 14, 10 through 12, Judah not acceptable to Jehovah. Chapter 15, 1 through 2, Judah to be cast out to death, famine, and captivity. Chapter 6, 15, 6 through 7, Jehovah has grown weary of their repenting, or their feigned repentance, their fake repentance, their counterfeit repentance, their counter, counterfeit religious worship. He's just tired of it. 16, 5 through 9, no one will mourn for Judah and gladness will seize. Well, th- th- look at all those prophecies. All of that is coming upon Judah. So what is the one thing, now Jeremiah, one thing he mentions, that if Israel do one thing, they could avoid all of that that I just went over. You could avoid all of it if you'll do just one thing. To hollow, from the Hebrew word kadosh, which means to consecrate, to set apart as sacred for a specific purpose, the Sabbath day. That's the one thing he asked them to do. If they did this, then Jerusalem and the throne of David would be spared. See verses 24 through 25. Verses 19 through 23, he tells them and pleads with them to hallow the Sabbath day. You can avoid it all. Now, they were too far gone. It was everlastingly assured. This is for us, brothers and sisters. Because the same things are going to come in the latter days to the wicked. Inside the church or outside the church. What will spare us? The Sabbath day. Well, what does that mean now? Let's take a look. Modern readers think only of Sunday or the Lord's Sabbath as the Sabbath. 
But for ancient Israel, Sabbath was, has a wider meaning. The weekly Sabbath was only one of several days called the Sabbath. All of the feast days, including Passover, Pentecost, Tabernacles, and the Day of Atonement, were also called Sabbaths. Thus, to keep my Sabbaths, plural, implied a keeping of the whole law of Moses, which it means Christ, because the whole law pointed to him, since the various feasts covered many aspects of Israel's commitment to God. Also, by revelation, the Lord told Moses that keeping the Sabbath was a sign of the covenant between Israel and God. When the prophets talked about polluting the Sabbath, they meant far more than simply working or playing on Sunday or Saturday for the Jews. Therefore, breaking our covenants would constitute breaking the Sabbath. This is the meaning of keeping the Sabbath day holy in Doctrine and Covenants section 9, 59, verses 9 through 14. See, one day is... is it's just a sign. It's a day where we get to put our actions where our mouth is. Yeah, I say I worship God and Christ and I love him. But on Sunday, I, I, I get to show it, not just say it. But keeping the law of God continually is keeping the Sabbath day holy. Look what section 59 says. That thou mayest more fully keep thyself unspotted from the world. Thou go to the house of prayer and offer up thy sacraments upon my holy day. For verily this is the day appointed unto you to rest from your labors, and to pay thy devotions to the Most High. Nevertheless, thy vows shall be offered up in righteousness on all days and at all times. That's the essence and whole meaning of the Sabbath day. I give a day where I'm consecrating to him and showing him and giving him a sign that I'll keep my covenants at all times, at all places, in all things. Do you see why the Sabbath day will save us? But maybe we ought to try keeping the Sabbath day to affect our climate instead of this climate fear porn hysteria we hear so much about. How about we turn our hearts to God? See, that's what it means to keep the Sabbath day. I keep my covenants always. And I set aside a day to remind me of that, that I need to do it always. The burden carried by the people on the Sabbath, Jeremiah talks about don't, don't carry a burden in or out, in and out of the city in their houses, seems to point most directly to the marketed trade and business, especially if the gate Jeremiah was to preach at was the gate of the temple, where sale and purchases of things used in the temple were had even on the Sabbath, contrary to the law of God. However, Jeremiah apprehended the very words of the law to do no work by cessation from all labor. Thus the burden Israel was carrying in Judah was the sin of breaking their covenant relationship with Jehovah to follow him and his will only. That is the true Sabbath. When I submit my will all days, all times, 24-7 to Jehovah Jesus Christ. How are we doing? Keeping the Sabbath day. That's what's going to save us. That's why the brethren talk about it and its significance. It's more than just one day of the week. There's one day we focus on that, but it's more than just one day. Dr. Sidney B. Sperry said, Living as we do in an age when the spirit of Sabbath observant is so flagrantly violated, it may be well for us to observe the remarkable importance attached by Jeremiah to keeping this day holy. Not only did the prophet command the people to hallow the Sabbath and not do any work therein, but he went so far as to promise that the city of Jerusalem would remain and be inhabited forever. This teaching of Jeremiah's gives a strong indication of how important the Lord considers Sabbath observance to be. Not only does one have a good opportunity on the Sabbath to meditate on God and his goodness, but also to worship him and rest both mentally and physically. Moreover, the Sabbath gives men the opportunity to build up love in their own households and of kindling a good spirit in their neighbors. Probably Jeremiah thought if the people would observe the spirit of the Sabbath, they would eventually be turned from their wicked course and be worthy of the promises of the Lord. And so it is for us. We want to avoid, at least personally, the destruction that will come in the last days, then I would get a handle on hallowing the Sabbath day. On our covenant relationship with Jehovah and keeping that covenant 
every day of the week, which we focus specifically on the Sabbath. That's what it means. Gospel principle, keeping the Sabbath is living by every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God on every day of the week. Jeremiah 18, 1 through 10. How was Judah clay in the hands of the potter? Well, Elder Heber C. Kimball preached at the house of the prophet Joseph Smith on the parable in the 18th chapter of Jeremiah of the clay in the hands of the potter, that when it marred in the hands of the potter, it was cut off the wheel and then thrown back again into the mill to go into the next batch and was a vessel of dishonor. But all clay that formed well in the hands of the potter and was pliable was a vessel of honor. And thus it was with the human family and ever will be. All that are pliable in the hands of God and are obedient to his commands are vessels of honor and God will receive them. President Joseph arose and said, Brother Kimball has given you a true explanation of the parable. Gospel principle, our obedience to the will of God will determine our acceptance by God. See, get over this. Well, God loves me. Well, yeah, he can love you in the telestial kingdom as well as the celestial kingdom. The idea is, am I acceptable to be in his presence? That's what I want. Is my life acceptable? Jeremiah 18, 17 through 23, smite him. Adam Clark, a great Bible commentary in the 1700s said, because of Jeremiah's boldness, the people entered into a league to punish the prophet. The phrase, let us smite him with the tongue is better translated, smite him on the tongue. Lying and false testimony are punished in the Eastern countries by smiting the person on the mouth with a strong piece of leather like the sole of a shoe. Can you imagine this is what they are want to do to a prophet. Jeremiah 20, 1 through 16, Jeremiah in stocks. Jeremiah 19, 14 through 15 records Jeremiah standing in the court of the temple, again reminding the people the troubles that lay ahead because of their wickedness. When Pashur, the chief overseer of the temple, heard of the incident, he had Jeremiah beaten and placed in stocks. Stocks were an instrument of torture by which the body was forced into an unnatural position, much as the wooden stocks of medieval times confined parts of the body, such as the arms, legs, or head, by means of wooden beams that locked them into place. Far from being cowed by this harsh treatment, Jeremiah used it as a further opportunity to teach. Pashur in Hebrew means free. Jeremiah, upon being released, told Pashur that the Lord had a different name for him, I bet. Jeremiah said that God had not called him Pashur or free, but Magor Misabib, which means fear on every side. Yeah, he was going to about find out what that means when the Babylonian army comes. Jeremiah 27 through 18, the weight of God's word. The great stress, the prophetic calling caused Jeremiah is particularly discernible in Jeremiah 27 through 8 and 14 through 18. The Hebrew word translated in verse 7 as deceived means literally enticed or persuaded. The power that persuaded the prophet to continue to preach God's word at such great personal cost was a burning fire shut up in his bones. Verse 9, it could not be stayed. Verses 14 through 18 reflect Jeremiah's despair over the lonely ministry he was given. Some scholars believe that these verses originally were meant to proceed verses 7 through 13 because of the tenor of lament changes in. Gospel principle, God's prophets will never be popular with societal norms or societal norms of the natural man and will be mocked and those who follow the prophets. Thank you for watching. Hit the like button if you enjoyed the presentation. Subscribe to the channel.